Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to quite a list of new Patreon subscribers. Alina, CB, Miri, El Bucko Such a Schmucko, Janet, Leanne, Hillary, and Natalia, who is still very much wishing for a dog. Just saying. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes and brand new collections so you can find your favorite recordings by topic, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip No subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's continue with more about that bucolic life and return to Ten Acres Enough, a practical experience showing how a very small farm may be made to keep a very large family with extensive and profitable experience in the cultivation of the smaller fruits. Written and published by James Miller, successor to C.S. Francis & Co., 522 Broadway. Entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1864 by James Miller in the clerk's office of the District Court of the United States for the Southern District of New York. Let's pick up right where we left off, planting on the farm. Let's begin. Chapter 7 Planting Raspberries and Strawberries Tricks of the Nursery My peach orchard was no sooner finished than I filled each row with raspberries, setting the roots two feet apart in the rows. This enabled me to get seven roots in between every two trees or 5,656 in all. This was equivalent to nearly two acres wholly planted with raspberries, according to the usual plan. They would go on growing without injuring the peach trees or being injured by them, and when the latter should reach their full growth, their shade would be highly beneficial to the raspberries, as they thrive better and bear more freely when half protected from the burning sun. The tops were cut off within a few inches of the ground, thus preventing any excessive draft upon the newly planted roots. No staking up was needed. These roots cost me $6 per thousand, or $34 for the lot, and were the ordinary red Antwerp. The season proving showery, They grew finely. Some few died, but my general luck was very satisfactory. I planted the whole lot in three days with my own hands. I am sure the growth of my raspberries was owing in a great degree to the deep plowing the land had received. The soil they delight in is one combining richness, depth, and moisture. 
It is only from such that a full crop may be expected every season. The roots must have abundance of elbow room to run down and suck up moisture from the abundant reservoir which exists below. Deep plowing will save them from the effects of dry weather, which otherwise will blast the grower's hopes, giving him a small berry shriveled up from want of moisture instead of one of ample size, rich and juicy. Hence, irrigation has been known to double the size of raspberries, as well as doubling the growth of the canes in a single season. Mulching also is a capital thing. One row so treated by way of experiment showed a marked improvement over all the others, besides keeping down the weeds. As a market fruit, the raspberry stands on the same list with the best, and I am satisfied that one cannot produce too much. For this purpose, I consider the red Antwerp most admirably adapted. There are twenty other varieties, some of which are probably quite as valuable, but I was unwilling to have my attention divided among many sorts. One really good berry was enough for me. Some of my neighbors have as much as ten acres in this fruit, from which they realize prodigious profits. Like all the smaller fruits, it yields a quick return to an industrious and painstaking cultivator. Immediately on getting my raspberries in, I went twice over the six acres with the cultivator, stirring up the ground some four inches deep, as it had been a good deal trampled down by our planting operations. This I did myself, with a thirty-dollar horse, which I had recently bought. Having eighteen feet between two rows of peach trees, I divided this space into five rows for strawberries, giving me nearly three feet between each row, in these rows I set the strawberry plants, one foot apart, making about 10,000 plants per acre, allowing for the headlands. I bought the whole 60,000 required for $2 per thousand, making $120. This was below the market price. In planting these, I got three of the children to help me, and though it was more tiresome work than they had ever been accustomed to, yet they stood bravely up to it. Every noon we four went home with raging appetites for dinner, where the plain but well-cooked fare provided by my wife and eldest daughter, for she kept no servant, was devoured with genuine country relish. The exercise in the open air for the whole week which it took us to get through this job did us all a vast amount of good. Roses came into the cheeks of my daughters, to which the cheeks aforesaid had been strangers in the city, and it was the general remark among us at breakfast that it had never felt so good to get to bed the night before. Thus honest labor brought wholesome appetites and sound repose. Most of us complained of joints a little stiffened by so much stooping, but an hour's exercise at more stooping made us limber for the remainder of the day. It occupied us a whole week to set out these plants, for we were all new hands at the business, but the work was carefully done and a shower coming on just as we had finished, it settled the earth nicely to the roots, and I do not think more than two hundred of them died. I intended to put a pinch of guano compost, or a handful of poudrette into each hill, but thought I could not afford it, and so let them go, trusting to be able to give them a dressing of some kind of manure the following spring. I much regretted this omission, as I was fully aware of the great value of the best strawberries, and plenty of them. 
My wife thought at first that six acres was an enormous quantity to have, inquired if I expected to feed the family on strawberries, and whether it was not worthwhile to set about raising some sugar to go with them, feeling certain that a great deal of that would be wanting. I forgot to say that I had planted Wilson's Albany seedling. This was the berry for which we had been compelled to pay such high prices while living in the city. Everybody testified to its being the most profuse bearer, while its great size and handsome shape made it eagerly sought after in the market. It was admitted, all things considered, to be the best market berry then known. My experience has confirmed this. True, it is a little tartar than most other varieties, and therefore requires more sugar to make it palatable. But this objection is more theoretical than practical, as I always noticed that when the berries came upon the table while living in the city, we continued to pile on the sugar, no matter what the price or quantity. The berries were there, and must be eaten. On one occasion, on repeating this observation to my wife, she admitted having noticed the same remarkable fact, and added that she believed strawberries would continue to be eaten, even if each quart required a pound of sugar to sweeten it. She declared that for her part, she and the children intended to do so in future. Now, although she was extravagantly fond of strawberries and had brought up our children in the same faith, this threat did not alarm me, for I knew that hereafter our berries would cost me nothing, and that if they devoured them too freely, sugar included, a slight pain under the apron of some of them would be likely to moderate their infatuation." I then suggested to her, how would it do, whether it would not make our establishment immensely popular, if in selling my berries, when the crop came in next year, to announce to the public that we would throw the sugar in. She looked at me a moment, and must have suspected that I was quizzing her, for she got up and left the room, saying she must go into the kitchen as she heard the tea kettle boiling over. But though I waited a full half hour, yet she did not return. The reader may have been all this time watching the condition of my purse, but he has not been so observant as myself. These plants did not cost me cash. I had intended to plant an acre or two to begin with, but after buying my peach trees and raspberries, the nurserymen inquired if I did not intend to plant strawberries also, as he had a very large quantity which he would sell cheap. His saying that he had a very large lot, and that he would sell them cheap, seemed to imply that he found a difficulty in disposing of them. Besides, the selling season was pretty nearly over. I therefore fought shy, and merely inquired his terms. This led to a long colloquy between us, in the course of which I held off just in proportion as he became urgent. At last, believing that I was not disposed to buy, although I went there for that very purpose, he offered to sell me 60,000 plants for $120 and to take his money out of the proceeds of my first crop. This offer I considered fair enough, much better than I expected, and after having distinctly agreed that he should depend upon the crop, and not on me, for payment, and that if the coming season yielded nothing, he should wait for the following one, I confessed to him that his persuasions had overcome me, and consented to the bargain. In other words, I did not run in debt. I saved just that much of my capital, 
and could make a magnificent beginning with our favorite fruit. As I was leaving this liberal man, he observed to me, Well, I am glad you have taken this lot, as I was intending to plow them in tomorrow. How is that? I inquired, not exactly understanding his meaning. Oh, said he, I have so many now that I must have the ground for other purposes, and so meant to plow them under if you had not bought them. This was an entirely new wrinkle to me, and fully explained why he could afford to farm them out on the conditions referred to. Though a capital bargain for me, yet it was a still better one for him. What he was to receive was absolutely so much clear gain. But then, after all that has been said and written, is it not a truth that cannot be disputed that no bargain can be pronounced a good one unless all the parties to it are in some way benefited? Here now were six acres of ground pretty well crowded up, at least on paper, but the strawberries would never grow higher than six inches. The raspberries would be kept down to three or four feet, while the peaches would overtop all. Each would be certain to keep out of the other's way. Then look at the succession. The strawberries would be in market first. The raspberries would follow, and then the peaches, for of the latter I had planted the earliest sorts, so that, unlike a farm devoted wholly to the raising of grain, which comes into market only once a year, I should have one cash-producing crop succeeding to another during most of the summer. On the remaining three acres I meant to raise something which would bring money in the autumn, so as to keep me flush all the time. You may say that this was reckoning my chickens before they were hatched, but you will please remember that thus far I have not even mentioned chickens, and I pray that you will be equally considerate. I know, at least I have some indistinct recollection, of having heard that the proof of the pudding lay in the eating. But pray be patient, even credulous, until the aforesaid mythical pudding is served up. I am now cooking it, and you ought all to know that cooks must not be hurried. In good time it will come smoking on the table. Chapter 8 Blackberries a remarkable coincidence. In the course of my agricultural reading for some years previous to coming into the country, I had noticed great things said of a new blackberry, which had been discovered in the state of New York. The stories printed in relation to it were almost fabulous. It was represented as growing twenty feet high, and as bearing berries nearly as large as a walnut, which melted on the tongue with a lusciousness to which the softest ice cream was a mere circumstance, while the fruit was said to be strung upon its branches like onions on a rope. A single bush would supply a large family with fruit, I was amazed at the extravagant accounts given of its unexampled productiveness and matchless flavor. I had supposed that I knew all about blackberries, but here was a great marvel in a department which had been proverbially free from eccentricities of that kind. But I followed it in the papers for a long time. At last I saw it stated that the rare plant could not be propagated from the seed, but only from suckers, and therefore very slowly. Of course it could not be afforded for less than a dollar apiece. It would be unreasonable to look for blackberries for less. It struck me that the superior flavor claimed for it must be a little of the silvery order, 
that in berries bought at that price, a touch might be detected even of the most auriferous fragrance. Still, I was an amateur in a small way. I rejoiced in a city garden which would readily accommodate a hundred of this extraordinary berry, especially as it was said to do better and bear more fruit when cut down to four feet instead of being allowed to grow to a height of twenty. It thus seemed to be made for such miniature gardeners as myself. One generous advertiser offered to send six roots by mail for five dollars, provided ten red stamps were enclosed with the money. I had never before heard of blackberries being sent by mail, but the whole thing was recommended by men in whose standing all confidence could be placed, and who, as far as could be discovered, had no plans to sell. Under such circumstances, doubt seemed to be absurd. I sent five dollars and the stamps, but this was one of the secrets I never told my wife until she had eaten the first bowlful of the fully ripened fruit eighteen months afterwards. Well, the plants came in a letter, mere fibers of a greater root, certainly not thicker than a thin quill, not one of them having a top. They looked like long white worms, with here and there a bud or eye. I never saw until then what I considered the meanest five dollars worth of anything I had ever bought. And when my wife inquired what those things were I was planting, I replied that they were little vegetable wonders which a distant correspondent had sent me, not dreaming that they cost me near a dollar apiece at the very time I owed a quarter's rent. She dropped the subject, but I planted them in a deeply spaded and rich sunny border, deluged them every week with suds from the family wash, and by the close of the season they had sent up more than a dozen strong canes which stood six feet high. The next summer they bore a crop of fruit which astonished me. From the group of bushes, I picked fifteen quarts of berries, superior to anything of the kind we had ever eaten. I then confided the secret to my wife. She considered the plants cheap at five dollars, and pronounced my venture a good one. I think we had more than five dollars worth of satisfaction in showing them to our friends and neighbors. We gave away some pints of the fruit, and such was its fame and popularity that I feel convinced we could have readily disposed of it all in the same way. One of the reporters for a penny paper, hearing of the matter, called in my absence to see them. My wife politely acted as showman, and being very eloquent of speech on any matter, which happens to strike her fancy, she was quite as communicative as he desired. She did not know that the fellow was a penny aligner, whose vocation it was to magnify an anthill into a mountain. To her extreme consternation, as well as to mine, the next morning's paper contained a half-column article describing my blackberries even giving my name and the number of the house. By ten o'clock that day, the latter was run down with strangers, who had thus been publicly invited to call and see the new blackberry. Our opposite neighbors laughed heartily over my wife's vexation, and for the first time in my life, I saw her almost immovable good temper give way. The nuisance continued for weeks, as the vile article had been copied into some of the neighboring country papers, 
and thus new swarms of boars were inflamed with curiosity. This little vexatious circumstance afforded unmistakable evidence of the great interest taken by the public in the discovery of a new and valuable fruit. I could have disposed of thousands of plants if I had had them for sale. This was the new Rochelle or Lawton blackberry. The numerous suckers which came up around each root I transplanted along my border until I had more than two hundred of them. This was long before a single berry had been offered for sale in the Philadelphia market, though the papers told me that the fruit was selling in New York at half a dollar per quart, and that the great consuming public of that city, having once tasted of it, was clamorous for more. I am constrained to say that the nurserymen who had these plants to sell did not overpraise them. This berry has fully realized all they promised in relation to it, and a debt of thankfulness is owing to the men who first discovered and caused it to be propagated. It has taken its place in public estimation beside the strawberry and raspberry, and will henceforth continue to be a favorite in every market where it may become known. This extraordinary fruit was first noticed in 1834 by Mr. Louis A. Secor of New Rochelle, New York, who observed a single bush growing wild in an open field, but loaded with astonishing clusters of larger berries than he had ever seen and of superior richness of flavor. At the proper season, he removed the plant to his garden, where he continued to propagate it for several years, during which time it won the unqualified admiration of all who had an opportunity of either seeing or tasting the fruit. Numerous plants were distributed, and its propagation in private gardens and nurseries began. A quantity of the fruit being exhibited at the Farmer's Club by Mr. William Lawton, the club named it after him, leaving the discoverer unrecognized. Great sums of money have been made by propagators of this berry. It possesses peculiar merits in the estimation of market gardeners, it ripens just as the supply of strawberries and raspberries has been exhausted, and before peaches and grapes have made their appearance, filling with delicious fruit a horticultural vacuum which had long existed. Its mammoth size and luscious qualities ensure for it the highest prices, and it has steadily maintained its original character. It pays the grower enormously, is a sure bearer, is never touched by frost or attacked by insect enemies, and when well manured and staked up from the wind and cut down to four feet high with the limbs shortened to a foot, will readily produce 2,000 quarts to the acre. Some growers have greatly exceeded this quantity, I have known a single plant to yield 1,800 berries and three plants to produce 16 quarts. Its flavor is entirely different from that of the common wild blackberry, while it abounds in juice and contains no core. It is evidently a distinct variety. It has also long been famous for yielding a most superior wine. When I went into the country, I had two hundred of the Lawton blackberry to plant, all which were the product of my five-dollar venture. In digging them up from my city garden, every inch of root that could be found was carefully hunted out. They had multiplied underground to a surprising extent, some of them being as much as twenty feet in length. 
these roots were full of buds from which new canes would spring. Their vitality is almost unconquerable. Everybody knows a blackberry is the hardest thing in the world to kill. I cut off the canes six inches above the root, then divided each stool into separate roots, and then cutting up the long roots into slips, containing one to two eyes each, I found my number of sets to exceed a thousand, quite enough to plant an acre. These I put out in rows eight feet apart, and eight feet asunder in the rows. Not ten of them died, as they came fresh out of the ground in one place, only to be immediately covered up some three inches deep in another. Thus the whole five-dollar speculation was one of the luckiest hits I ever made. Because I began early, before the plant had passed into everybody's hands, and when it came into general demand, I was the only grower near the city who had more than a dozen plants. Very soon, everybody wanted the fruit, and the whole neighborhood wanted the plants. How I condescended to supply both classes of customers will appear hereafter. Yet while setting out these roots, several of my neighbors, as usual when I was doing anything, came to oversee me. On former occasions, they had expressed considerable incredulity as to my operations, and it was easy to see from their remarks and inquiries now that they thought I didn't know much, and would have nothing for my labor but my pains. I always listened good-humoredly to their remarks, because I discovered that now and then they let fall something which was of real value to me. When they discovered it was blackberries I was planting, some of them laughed outright, but I replied that this Lawtonberry was a new variety, superior to anything known and an incredible bearer. They answered me they could find better ones in any fence corner in the township, and that if I once got them into my ground I could never get them out. It struck me the last remark would also apply as justly to my peach trees. But I contented myself with saying that I should never want to get them out and that the time would come when they should all want the same thing in their own ground. Thus it is that pioneers in anything are generally ridiculed and discouraged by the general multitude. Of all my visitors, only two appear to have any correct knowledge of the new plant. They offer to buy part of my stock, but on refusing to sell they engaged to take some in the autumn. I have been thus particular in writing of the Lawton because of my singular success with it from the start. I thus occupied my seventh acre. But the rows being eight feet apart, abundant room was left to raise a crop of some kind between them. Even in the rows between the roots, I planted corn which grew well and afforded a most beneficial shade to the young blackberries as they grew up. I am satisfied they flourished better for being thus protected the first season from the hot sun, when in full maturity they need all the sun they can get. They will grow and flourish in almost any soil in which they once become well-rooted, though they are rank feeders on manure. Like a young pig, feed them well and they will grow to an astonishing size. Starve them, and your crops will be mere runts. It is from the same skinning practice that so many corn cribs are seen to abound in nubbins. I had thus two acres left unoccupied, one acre, as previously stated, was most fortunately in clover. 
On this, I put four bushels of ground plaster mixed with a sprinkling of guano, the two costing me only five dollars. I afterwards devoted an acre to tomatoes, and the last to parsnips, cabbages, turnips, and sweet corn. This latter was scattered in rows or drills three feet apart, intending it for green fodder for the horse and cow when the clover gave out. The turnips were sowed between the corn rows and were intended for winter feeding for horse and cow. On the acre of blackberries between the rows, I planted cabbage, putting into each hill a spoonful of mixed plaster and guano, and wherever I could find vacant spots about the place, there also a cabbage plant was set out. A few pumpkin hills were started in suitable places. In fact, my effort was to occupy every inch of ground with something, the cabbage and tomato plants cost me $30. These several crops were put in as the season for each one came round. The green corn crop was not all put in at one time, but at intervals about two weeks apart, so that I should have a succession of succulent food during the summer. The horse and cow were to be kept in the barnyard, as I had no faith in turning cattle out to pasture, thus requiring three times as much land as was necessary, besides losing half the manure. The latter was a sort of hobby with me. I was determined to give my crops all they could profitably appropriate, and so soil my little stock. That is, keep them in the barnyard in summer and in the stable in winter, while their food was to be brought to them instead of their being forced to go after it. I knew it would cost time and trouble, but I have long since discovered that most things of value in this world come to us only as the result of diligent, unremitted labor. The man, even upon ten acres, who is content to see around him only barren fields, scanty crops, and lean, starving animals, does not deserve the name of farmer. Unless he can devise ways and means for changing such a condition of things, and cease ridiculing all propositions of amendment that may be pointed out to him, he had better be up and off and give place to a live man. Such skinning and exhausting tillage is one cause of the annual relative decline of the wheat crop all over the Union and of the frequent changes in the ownership of lands. The fragrance of a fat and ample manure heap is as grateful to the nostrils of a good farmer as the fumes of the tavern are notoriously attractive to those of a poor one. Chapter 9 The Garden Female Management Comforts and Profits I mentioned some time ago that the wife of the former owner of this place had left it with a world of regrets. She had been passionately fond of the garden which now fell to us, as daylight can be seen through very small holes, so little things will illustrate a person's character. Indeed, character consists in little acts and honorably performed, daily life being the quarry from which we build it up and rough you the habits that form it. The garden she had prepared and cultivated for several years, doing much of the work of planting, watching, watering, and training with her own hands, bore honorable testimony to the goodness of hers. She had filled it with the choicest fruit trees, most of which were now in full bearing. There was abundance of all the usual garden fruits, currants, gooseberries, grapes, and an ample asparagus bed. It was laid out with taste, convenience, and liberality. 
Flowers, of course, had not been omitted by such a woman. Her vocation had evidently been something beyond that of merely cooking her husband's dinners. But her garden bore marks of long abandonment. Great weeds were rioting in the borders. Grass had taken foothold in the alleys, and it stood in need of a new mistress to work up into profitable use the store of riches it contained. It struck me that if one woman could establish a garden like this, I could find another on my own premises to manage it. After I had got through with the various plantings of my standard fruits, indeed, while much of it was going on, I took resolute hold of the garden. It was large enough to provide vegetables for three families. I meant to make it sure for one. With all the lights and improvements of modern times, and they are many, three-fourths of the farm gardens in our country are still a disgrace to our husbandry. As a rule, the most easily raised vegetables are not to be found in them, and the small fruits, with the exception of currants and gooseberries, are universally neglected. Many of our farmers have never tasted an early York cabbage. If they get cabbages or potatoes by August, they think they are doing pretty well. They do not understand the simple mysteries of a hotbed, and so force nothing. Now with this article, which need not cost five dollars, and which a boy of ten years can manage... You can have cabbages and potatoes in June, and beans, tomatoes, cucumbers, and squashes, and a host of other delicious vegetables a little later. By selecting your seed, you can have salad, green peas, onions, and beets by the last of June, or before without any forcing. A good asparagus bed covering two square rods of ground is a luxury that no farmer should be without. It will give him a palatable dish, green and succulent, from the bosom of the earth, every day from May to July. A good variety of vegetables is within the reach of every farmer the year round. They are not only an important means of supporting the family, paying at least one-half the table expenses, but they are greatly conducive to health. They relieve the terrible monotony of salt junk, and in the warm season prevent the fevers and bowel complaints, so often induced by too much animal food. Neglect is thus too much the rule. A row of currants, for example, is planted in a garden it will indeed bear well with neglect. But an annual manuring and thinning out of old wood would at least triple the size of the fruit and improve its quality. The row of currants will furnish a daily supply of refreshing fruit to the table for months together. Why should its culture then be totally neglected? When a row of corn by its side of equal length which will supply only a single feeding to a pen of hogs, is most carefully manured, watched, plowed, and hoed. Who, after expending large sums in establishing a young orchard of trees, would destroy one half by choking them with a crop of oats or clover, because they could not afford to lose the use of the small strip of land a few feet wide in the row, which ought to have been kept clean and cultivated. I began by deepening the garden soil wherever a spade could be put in. I hired a man for this purpose, and paid him ten dollars for the job, including the hauling and digging in of the great pile of manure I had found in the barnyard, and the clearing up of things generally. I would have laid out fifty dollars in manure if the money could have been spared, 
but what I did afforded an excellent return. My wife and eldest daughter Kate, then in her 18th year, did all the planting. I spent five dollars in buying for them, a complete outfit of hose, rakes, and trowels for garden use, lightly made on purpose for female handling, with a neat little wheelbarrow to hold the weeds and litter, which I felt pretty sure would have to be hoed up and trundled away before the season was over. They took to the garden manfully. I kept their hose constantly sharpened with a file, and they declared it was only pastime to wage warfare on the weeds with weapons so keen. Now and then one of the boys went in to give them a lift, and when a new vegetable bed was to be planted, it was dug up and made ready for them but the great bulk of all other work was done by themselves. Never has either of them enjoyed health so robust or appetite so wholesome. As a whole year's crop of weeds had gone to seed, they had millions of the enemy to contend with, just as I had anticipated. I did not volunteer discouragements by repeating to them the old English formula, that one year's seeding makes seven years' weeding, but commended their industry, exhorted them to persevere, and was lavish in my admiration of the handsome style in which they kept the ground. I infused into their minds a perfect hatred of the whole tribe of weeds, enjoined it upon them not to let a single one escape and go to seed and promised them that if they thus exterminated all, the next year's weeding would be mere recreation. I will say for them that all our visitors from the city were surprised at seeing the garden so free from weeds, while they did not fail to notice that most of the vegetables were extremely thrifty. They did not know that in gardens where the weeds thrive undisturbed, the vegetables never do. As to the neighbors, they came in occasionally to see what the women were doing, but shook their heads when they saw they were merely hoeing up weeds, said that weeds did no harm, and they might as well attempt to kill all the flies. They had been brought up among weeds, knew all about them, and it was no use trying to get rid of them but the work of weeding kept on through the whole season, and as a consequence the ground about the vegetables was kept constantly stirred. The result of this thorough culture was that nearly everything seemed to feel it, and the growth was prodigious, far exceeding what the family could consume. We had everything we needed, and in far greater abundance than we ever had in the city. I am satisfied this profusion of vegetables lessened the consumption of meat in the family one half. Indeed it was such that my wife suggested that the garden had so much more in it than we required that perhaps it would be as well to send the surplus to the store where we usually bought our groceries to be there sold for our benefit. The town within half a mile of us contained some 5,000 inhabitants, among whom there was a daily demand for vegetables. I took my wife's advice, and from time to time gathered such as she directed, for she and Kate were sole mistresses of the garden, and sent them to the store. They kept a regular book account of these consignments, and when we came to settle up with the storekeeper at the year's end, were surprised to find that he had eighty dollars to our credit. But this was not all from vegetables. A good deal of it came from the fruit trees. After using in the family great quantities of fine peaches from the ten garden trees, certainly three times as many as we could ever afford to buy when in the city, 
the rest went to the store. The trees had been so hackled by the worms that they did not bear full crops, yet the yield was considerable. Then there were quantities of spare currants, gooseberries, and several bushels of common blue plums. When my wife discovered that there was so ready a market at our own door, she suffered nothing to go to waste. It was a new feature in her experience. Everything seemed to sell. Whenever she needed a new dress for herself or any of the children, all she had to do was to go to the store, get it, and have it charged against her garden fund. I confess that her success greatly exceeded my expectations. Let me now put in a word as to the cause of this success with our garden. It was not owing to our knowledge of gardening, for we made many blunders not here recorded, and lost crops of two or three different things in consequence. Neither was it owing to excessive richness of the ground, but I lay it to the unsparing warfare kept up upon the weeds, which thus prevented their running away with the nourishment intended for the plants, and kept the ground constantly stirred up and thoroughly pulverized. I have sometimes thought one good stirring up, whether with the hoe, the rake, or the cultivator, was as beneficial as a good shower. When vegetables begin to look parched and the ground becomes dry, some gardeners think they must commence the use of the watering pot. This practice, to a certain extent, and under some circumstances, may perhaps be proper, but as a general rule it is incorrect. The same time spent in hoeing, frequently stirring the earth about vegetables, is far preferable. When watering has once commenced, it must be continued, must be followed up, else you have done mischief instead of good, as after watering a few times and then omitting it, the ground will bake harder than if nothing had been done to it. Not so with hoeing or raking. The more you stir the ground about vegetables, the better they are off, and whenever you stop hoeing, no damage is done as in watering. Vegetables will improve more rapidly, be more healthy, and in better condition at maturity by frequent hoeing than by frequent watering. This result is very easily shown by experiment. Just notice after a dewy night the difference between ground lately and often stirred and that which has lain unmoved for a long time. Or take two cabbage plants under similar circumstances. Water one, and stir the other just as often, stirring the earth about it carefully and thoroughly, and see which will distance the other in growth. There are secrets about this stirring of the earth, which chemists and horticulturists would do well to study with the utmost scrutiny and care. Soil cultivated in the spring and then neglected soon settles together. The surface becomes hard. The particles cohere. They attract little or no moisture. And from such a surface even the rain slides off, apparently doing little good. But let this surface be thoroughly pulverized though it be done merely with an iron rake and only a few inches in depth, and a new life is infused into it. The surface becomes friable and soft. The moisture of the particles again becomes active, attracting and being attracted, each seeming to be crying to its neighbor, hand over, hand over, more drink, more drink. Why this elaboration should grow less and less, till in a comparatively short time it should seem almost to cease, is a question of very difficult solution. Though the varying compositions of soils, 
has doubtless something to do with the matter. But let the stirring be carefully repeated, and all is life again. Particles attract moisture from the atmosphere. Hand it to each other. Down it goes to the roots of vegetables. The little suction fibers drink it in. And though we cannot see these busy operations, yet we perceive their healthy effects in the pushing up of vegetables above the surface. The hoe is better than the water pot. My garden is a signal illustration of the fact. And with that practical assertion, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Ten Acres Enough, which continues to seem like a pretty succinct and useful book. It actually makes me wonder how much of this is still perfectly good advice for the farmer looking to escape the city and create a new life. I'm sure I'll never know, but if you're interested in learning from this book yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.